Hello, and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench, we have the second half of a question from a viewer, which is the Type 130 LCR meter, using this to measure the front end of a scope and making the front end match the capacitance that's on the faceplate. So in prepping for this video and doing some experimentation around the lab, things like that, because I was also of the mind with this person, this viewer, that this might be something that would be desirable. However, the more I thought about it, the more I realized this might not be what we want to do. This may actually kind of be a detriment to uh, the performance of the scope. The other thing is there are some unique challenges in measuring this front end with this meter, with this input. And we'll get into that, too, in more detail in this video. So if that sounds like it's interesting, hang around. We'll take a look. And uh, we'll talk about scope front ends. This is going to get a little bit deep in the weeds, but uh, we're going to go into why you may not want this plug to be at 20 picofarads of capacitance, because it might be better to be set somewhere else. One of the short answers is, it's actually kind of hard to use this meter to measure that port. Because if I get a chunk of coax, we'll even get a short chunk of coax, zero out the meter, if I get a short chunk of coax, which this is probably six inches, five inches, something like that. So just a five inch chunk of coax, there's a substantial cable capacitance in here. We're on the 30 picofarad range. So with 30 picofarad, this six inch chunk of coax has a distributed capacitance of call it 14 picofarad. Now I can measure, I could do a delta measurement from here. I could hook this up and pop over. I'll have to go up a range because with this being 20, it's going to push it off the scale. So I'll have to pop it up a range and then we can plug, plug the scope front end in. And we have a total reading of, call it 20, no, 30, just shy of 35 picofarad of input capacitance. Now, that's actually pretty accurate. Um, we got the 15, and then this is rated at 20 for this particular plug-in is rated at 20, p um, 20 picofarad. So this is actually not too bad. We're down at the bottom of the range, so our accuracy is not the best, but... We're within the ballpark, but I wouldn't want to adjust here. So what I'm adjusting would be a little too much. Really wouldn't be able to see what's going on. So we got to think about something a little different. Okay, so why would someone want to tightly control the input capacitance on a scope input or scope plug-in? And why would we actually care? Uh, one of the reasons that you might want to do that is if you have a matched capacitance on the two inputs, it'd be very easy to take a probe, move it down here, and you wouldn't have to readjust the probe per input. This is not recommended by the service manual. Um, they actually specifically advise against that. Anytime a probe is moved, readjusting of the, readjusting of the compensation capacitor in the probe is always recommended by the manufacturers. And I believe that's universally recommended by scope manufacturers. So that is something that um, it's just the way it is. The other problem is we have to deal with a little bit of this formula right here, which is our X of C capacitive reactance formula. Problem with... Um, X of C of a scope input is, the more reactive the capacitance, this would essentially be a dynamic resistance as seen by the scope. We have a frequency component and a capacitive component. So if the frequency goes up and the capacitance stays the same, we get more X of C. And if the capacitance goes up and the frequency stays the same, we get more X of C. X of C being capacitive reactance. This is also why 1X scope probes are fairly terrible. Uh, in terms of their frequency response. Now, they're great because they don't attenuate the signal, so you can look at low amplitude signals. 
the problem is with all the X of C, or the capacitive reactants, they attenuate very, very rapidly on frequency. So yes, they work. However, they c they're usually rated very slow. Some of them are only rated to about 6 megahertz on a 100 megahertz input. So where we have 100 megahertz with a 10x probe, we have only about 6, six to 10 megahertz with a 1x probe. Now, we can prove that with the Type 130. And what I'll do is to simulate a typical 1x probe. Now, the scope's not even on. This is just a chunk of coax. And we'll pop this in on a probe input. The probe isn't on. It's in DC mode, actually. So we're DC right into the front attenuator. But if I pop this in here, you can see we are well over 100 picofarads of capacitance on that probe. Actually, i got to go down to the 300 picofarad range. And we're actually about 100, let's call it 130, just shy of 130 picofarads of capacitance on the 1x probe. And this is into the into the scope input. Like if I move over here, here's the other end of the cable. We're actually plugged into the scope, and we're reading 130, 130 puff at the input here. Now it would be slightly worse if we put a um, like alligator clips on it. Slightly worse, but inconsequential at that point. So with 120. We'll call it 130 picofarads of capacitance. We'll run the numbers on some different frequencies, and we'll see what happens really, really quickly. So as we can see from the quick math, our input impedance drops very, very rapidly when frequency goes up. So starting at 1 hertz, we have a 1.224 gig ohm input impedance. Now this is great for measurement. We're not having much circuit loading. The circuit under test can't see the scope input. Um, very lightly coupling into the circuit under test. So kind of just sniffing the signal there. Not going to load the circuit too much. So driving this 1 gig ohm or 1.2 gig ohm input impedance at 1 hertz is not really going to be a problem for the 1x probe. 10 hertz, we're still above what DMMs usually sit at, so 122 mega ohms, not a problem. Starting to get into 100 hertz, now, this is the low end of audio. Like, I mean, we're not really moving very fast, considering that the scope has a, it's a 100 megahertz, actually, that's a 200 megahertz plug-in. Um, the 7A26 is actually 200 megahertz plug-in, so even at 100 hertz, we're at 12 meg, still great for measurement. Um, most meters have a 10 meg ohm input impedance, so this is still absolutely acceptable. However, at 1 kilohertz, we start falling off pretty rapidly. 1 kilohertz, we have 1 meg ohm input impedance, so this would kind of be, we're at the, we're actually at the rated input impedance of the scope at 1 kilohertz on a 200 megahertz plug-in. So we still have plenty of bandwidth, but we're running out of input. We're going to have to start really driving this input a lot harder due to the capacitive reactants. So on, and as you go up, even 10 kilohertz, so we're not even out of audio yet, but a 10 kilohertz signal will see a 122K input impedance on a 1X probe. That's and this is why 1x probes tend to derate very, very rapidly because their reactance goes up. They have a, the circuit has to co compensate for that to drive them. So what I'll do is I'll flip this over to a 10 meg, 10x probe, and we'll take a look at the capacitive coupling of a 10x probe. Okay, so I have a 10x probe hooked up. This is an adapter to take a 10x probe to a B and C. So this just slips on the front and the pin goes into the center pin of the adapter and the ground gets picked up from the clamp. So this is actually a great little adapter to probe B and C's. With this being a B and C, we can do that. And as we can already tell, we are much, much lightly coupled, coupled using the same plug-in, same scope, 10x probe, we have a much lighter capacitance drive 
or capacitance burden, I should say, on the circuit under test, the circuit under test in this case being the LC meter. Just to prove it, here's where the probe's plugged in. So same input, same, same everything. All we did was convert from a 1x probe to a 10x probe. So we'll crank this down. Oh, it's a little too much. So on our 30, 30 picofarad scale, uh, we're at 10, 14? Yeah, we'll call it 14 picofarads of coupling on the 10x probe. So let's run these numbers again. I'll use the same numbers, same frequencies, but instead of having 130 puff, we'll do 14. All right, no shocker there. All the numbers are about 10x higher because we have a 10x, 10 times lightly or coupled because of the 10x probe. So our input impedance roughly bounces to 10x, a little bit off because we're not down 100% a 10x factor. We're at, we went from 130 puff to 14 puff, but we have, uh, even at 10 hertz, we're not in the gig ohms. Uh, at 100 hertz, we're, we're at the high meg ohms. Um, one kilohertz, we're still in the meg ohms, and even at a, and even at 10 kilohertz, we're still in the meg ohms. We haven't dropped out into the k ohms yet. So, much lightly or coupled, better for signal integrity, better for signal probing, and that is some of the magic of the 10x probes. Comes at a cost of. I get 10x lighter circuit loading, but I also get 10x less signal coming into the scope, so the amplifier on the front end of the scope has to work harder. This is just one of the trade-offs with passive probes, and also why passive probes really don't go past much past uh, 500 megahertz to a gigahertz. So at the, at the very, very top end, I've seen gigahertz passive probes uh, they'll sometimes have like 1.2 picofarads of coupling, very, very light coupling. But one of the reasons why everything flips to active probes is to get some of this capacitive drive down, and so we don't kill the signal with reactants of the probe, the wire, the input, the everything. Uh, and a lot of those probes are active probes. They usually have FET inputs. They're amplified and buffered, so it really helps get the measurements without killing the signal and this is also one of the one of the reasons why scopes have that 3 dB input is as the frequency goes up the input impedance goes down which means the circuit has a harder and harder time to drive the scope input uh, and has to work harder to do that due to loading and so that's part of the negative 3 dB rating of an oscilloscope front end so having been through the exercise What's the right answer? Well, in terms of measurement, signal fidelity, measurement capability, the right answer is the least amount of capacitive coupling possible. So do we want a 20 picofarad input on a scope? No, we want the scope to be calibrated correctly, but actually we want the lightest amount of capacitive coupling on the front end of the scope that we can, that we can get because that will interfere with the incoming signal the least. Now, in audio, does this matter? Not really. The frequencies are kind of low. And a couple of other things. When you start pushing the scope to its upper bandwidth limit, this is where it really starts to get a little funny and things start to matter. Um, and then the faster you go, the faster it matters. I mean, I, got, I, I have some stuff that we're going to do here coming up that I'm going to have to adjust 5 gigahertz signals here in the lab. And I still don't even have, um, I've been saying this for a while, but I, and I need to get it, but I still don't even have cable that can handle that 5 gigahertz signal very well. I need to get some SMA. Um, actually, the scope input on that is a 25 gigahertz plug-in. So it has 3.5 millimeter RF connectors, um, air gap dielectric, specifically for the, some of this capacitive reactance problem, problems, in quotes. Really, we're running into running into some of the physics aspe aspect of some of this. And so that's just some stuff we're going to have to deal with when we adjust one of the 284s with its 5 gigahertz square waves, which is kind of wild. Oh, uh, one thing is turning the, uh, turning the scope on actually doesn't change 
the input at all. There's no active circuitry, so even having the scope off, the capacitive coupling was the same. Uh, so firing up the scope isn't going to move the needle at all. But we'll get a good uh, waveform of what the output is on the 130. So the other thing, too, is on a 400 series scope, if we're doing the calibration on a 7000 series amplifier, it wasn't called out as much, but a 400 series scope, the upper channel, is it the bottom channel or the upper channel? One of the channels is, is set in such a way to make sure the same probes will work for both. So there was kind of a compromise of the adjustment with making sure the probes could be used on both inputs. You can set it, and the uh, adjustment range was so wide on the front end of a 400 series scope that you could set it perfectly, but then the probe may not compensate on the bottom because there is a range. Turn this up. There is an adjustment range of the tuning capacitor in the probe, so the tuning capacitor has to be able to compensate to whatever the input capacitance actually is on the plug-in. So not all probes can be mixed, and some probes will need faster plug-ins, things like that. Like this probe cannot talk to a 7A19 regardless, because a 7A19 needs a 50-ohm input. But a 200 megahertz probe will actually have a lighter capacitance than a 100 megahertz probe, just kind of the way some of the equipment is built. Thanks for stopping by the lab and taking a look at the deeper dive into scope front ends and capacitive reactance of signals. Uh, this video came out of a user comment to the channel, and I split it up from the other video, so it would probably it would be easier to find in the video catalog. As always, I take a look at all the comments in between videos. So if you have any questions, drop me a line, and we'll see what we can get in front of the camera and get recorded. Thanks again to the patrons who help keep the lights on here in the lab and videos coming up to the channel. If you'd like some additional content, take a look at the Patreon page. Patrons are running ahead from the YouTube releases, and there's a bit more content up there. And with that, as always, more is on the way, and I will see everybody in the next video. Bye for now.